Hello everyone. Today we're going down a dark and twisty road back to 1981 with a quadruple homicide in Ketty, California. An unsolved quadruple homicide known as the Ketty Cabin Murders. Now the case may be a little more graphic than others because I think it's important to understand the crime. So if you're not up for that today, I definitely recommend clicking off this video. I have a ton of other videos on my channel that aren't as graphic. So if you're looking for something like that, Again, I don't recommend watching this one. I'm gonna let you know here, there are a lot of names in this story, so I'm gonna do my best to try to reiterate who these people are because I got really confused while researching this, trying to remember who everyone was. So I'm gonna do my best um, to try to keep this organized for everyone. But this is a case that I would love to see solved one day, so let's get into the details. Glenna Susan Sharp, who would later go by Sue, was born on March 29th of 1945 in Springfield, Massachusetts. Now, Sue was described as a quiet, reserved, and overall nice person. She'd go on to marry James Sharp, who in 1965 served in the Vietnam War, but from all accounts, things didn't seem to be the greatest with this man. The couple would eventually go on to have five children, but there was a bunch of different stories I heard of abuse happening in the relationship. Their daughter, Sheila, would also go on to write a book as an adult, claiming she suffered at the hands of a pedophilic father. Sue's sister, Jackie Holbert, also talked about Sue leaving and staying with her for times and then going back to James, and getting kicked back out again eventually. So things overall just didn't seem very great with the Sharp family. But eventually Sue would find the means to leave James and take their five children and she would end up moving from Connecticut to Northern California in an area where her brother lived. Not having very much money when she moved over there, Sue and her five children would actually end up staying in her brother's small trailer at the Claremont Trailer Village in Quincy. She got a job working part-time at the Quincy Elks Lodge and she also took up typewriting classes. But sometime during all of this, Sue's 13 year old daughter Sheila would end up getting pregnant and she would end up going to live with her aunt Jackie until she gave birth. Now the information surrounding this pregnancy and birth is very limited but as far as I seen which I could be wrong about so let me know down below if I am it seems that Sheila ended up having to give up this baby and she gave it up for adoption and then Sheila would eventually go back to living with her mother and her siblings. All I know is that it must have happened or something must have happened with the baby like that because the baby was not around when the murders happened. The following fall, once things started getting kind of more uphill for the family, they ended up moving to cabin 28 in the rural town of Ketty. This cabin was a two bedroom home in the woods along with some other cabins at what was called the Ketty Resort. And this area used to be a family resort, but due to financial reasons, they ended up having to kind of shut it all down. And then they ended up transforming all of the cabins into low income homes, which was perfect timing for Sue and her children because they had been cramped up in the small trailer and they needed more room. The kids were getting older and it all kind of seemed to be working out for them that this cabin opened up that they could move into. It was a two bedroom, small little house. You go in the front door and there's the living room and then you go straight through, there's the kitchen. At the time, it had, between the kitchen and our living room was a little wall. That wall is gone now due to remodeling that they've done to the place and the two rooms along with the bathroom were off to the right. And as I said, the children were getting older and there was 15 year old John, 14 year old Sheila, 12 year old Tina, 10 year old Rick and five year old Greg. So you can imagine all of these people along with 36 year old Sue shoved into a small trailer wasn't probably the best living environment. So they were probably all very excited to move into this bigger home. And after living in this cabin for around five months, the family seemed to be thriving. They were making friends in the neighborhood things were coming together for them. The family that had once been living in fear in Connecticut was finally now seeming to start to thrive in the small woodsy community. Unfortunately, sadly, that wouldn't last very long. April 11th in 1981 was a Saturday and it was a busy weekend for the family. A lot was going on. Around 11.30 a.m. that day, Sue, along with her two children, Sheila and Greg, ended up going for a drive to pick up Rick, who was attending a baseball tryout at Grancer Field in the neighboring town of Quincy. Now, during this drive, I seen that they came across John and one of his friends, Dana Hall Wingate. And it seems that the two were hitchhiking from Quincy to Ketty. And so they ended up picking the two of them up and driving them back to Ketty with them. However, two hours later, around 3.30 PM, it seems that John and Dana ended up hitchhiking back to Quincy because they wanted to go hang out with some friends there. I also seen in some talks about the situation of why John and Dana wanted to be in Quincy. It seems that Dana had a girlfriend there. And so he wanted to go there to see his girlfriend. Either way, the two teenage boys wanted to go to Quincy to hang out with friends. And it seems to be corroborated that they were in town because that day there were witnesses in the downtown area of Quincy that ended up seeing the two boys near the gas station. 
Now that evening, 14-year-old Sheila actually had plans to spend the night and sleep over at the Seabolt home. And the Seabolts lived in cabin 27, which was next door to their cabin. So at this point in night, it seems that 12 year old Tina was actually already at the Seabolt's house and she was watching TV over there with some of their children. And around 8 p.m., Sheila actually ended up going over to the Seabolt's, letting her know that their mother wanted her home around 10 p.m. at the latest. This left Sue at home with her 10 year old son, Rick, five year old Greg, and then the boy's friend, Justin Smart, who was around 12 years old. Around 9.55 p.m., Tina returned home to cabin 28. Later that night, John and his friend Dana ended up returning home, but it's unsure at what point in the night they returned home as well as how they even got back home from Quincy. It leaves the question of, did they have a friend drive them home? Did a stranger drive them home because they were hitchhiking? It seems to kind of be up in the air. All we know is that the next morning, 14 year old Sheila ended up waking up at the Seabolt's home and deciding she wanted to go back to her house to change into some church clothes. Because remember, it was Sunday by this point. And when Sheila ended up walking into her home, into cabin 28, she was immediately met with three dead bodies on the living room floor and a very bloody crime scene. It would turn out that these bodies were of her mother, Sue, her brother, John, and his friend, Dana. When I came in, Johnny was somewhere right in here then Dana and then mom. And mom was by the couch. And rightfully terrified, Sheila would run from cabin 28 back to the Seabolt's house looking for anyone to help her. The oldest son of the family, Jamie Seabolt, would end up going back over to cabin 28 with Sheila to help her. And this is when they ended up looking into one of the bedroom windows. And this is where they would find 10 year old Rick, five year old Greg, as well as their friend, Justin Smart, unharmed, alive and sleeping in the bedroom. And Jamie would end up waking the boys out and coaxing them out of the bedroom window to try to, you know, save them from witnessing what had happened in the living room. But after searching everywhere, 12 year old Tina was nowhere to be accounted for. Everyone else was at this point, except for Tina. However, it was said that her bedding was stained with what looked like blood. Now, Jamie Seabolt would later admit to entering the home from the back door, and he said he did this to see if anybody else was inside, but this potentially could have contaminated the crime scene. Honestly, having all of these people, like even opening up the bedroom windows to get the kids out, doing all of this stuff, any of that could have contaminated the crime scene. Even Sheila walking in the front door and just seeing the bodies and running out contaminated the crime scene because she touched the doorknob. And back in the 80s, things like this weren't really preserved the best. And honestly, I can understand wanting to search the house looking for Tina because the other three boys were alive, but we had three bodies in the living room. So of course they'd want to see if where Tina was and if she was okay. But we do have to keep in mind, it probably did contaminate the crime scene to some degree. Either way, police would immediately be contacted. So let's talk about this crime scene because it was awful. And this is where I'm going to go into more detail. So if you want to skip ahead, I don't blame you, but I do think it's important to talk about the state of the bodies and what happened here. Blood was everywhere in this home. Blood was across the living room floors, the doors, the ceilings. There was even blood on a wood post on the front porch leaving the home, which kind of looks like fingerprints. Knife marks would also be said to be found on the walls. A bloody hammer and a steak knife bent at a 30 degree angle was also found laying on the floor. Another larger knife would also eventually be recovered. Now, 36 year old Sue Sharp would be found lying on the floor near the sofa and she was nude from the waist down. However, there were no signs of SA presence. She was gagged with a blue bandana and her own underwear and bound with electrical cords and medical tape around her wrists as well as her ankles. And she also showed the most signs of defensive wounds, meaning that she most likely fought off the attackers the hardest. Sue also had been stabbed repeatedly in the chest and neck. And there was also an imprint that showed she'd been hit in the head with a butt of a Daisy 880 Powerline BB pellet rifle. Now, 15 year old John was also tied up and gagged with the same materials. However, his throat had been cut and his head had been beaten in with a hammer. Dana had also been tied up and gagged, his head had been struck with a hammer, and he had been strangled to death. Autopsies determined that Sue and John had died from knife wounds and blood force trauma, whereas Dana had been asphyxiated. Now, right off the bat, investigators believe that there had to at least be two individuals involved here to be able to subdue three people, let alone wrangle four other children that were in the house into the bedroom, let alone whatever happened to Tina. Meaning that when the killers entered this home, they had up to seven people to face. But despite how brutal and messy this crime scene was and how much evidence you think there would be, police could not find any DNA. I also seen that there was no forensic evidence to suggest that Tina had been a victim that night. However, I also seen that it looked to be blood on her bedding. Blood spatter pattern analysis also showed that all three bodies had been moved post-mortem. The investigation also found that there was no signs of forced entry. However, 
keep in mind back in these times, people would leave their doors unlocked. It was not uncommon, especially in rural places like this. However, police did find that there was a toolbox missing from the home along with a second hammer, and that was believed to be a murder weapon. All of the blinds in the home were found to be closed, trying to possibly conceal what had happened inside, and the telephone had also been left off the hook and the cord for it was cut meaning that no one in the home could have called the police for help and no one from the outside maybe could have seen anything because the blinds were shut. Now, when investigators questioned the three little boys that had been found in the bedroom, all of them said that they didn't see anything, they didn't hear anything and claimed they had slept through the night. But police did not believe that, especially with how graphic and bloody and violent this crime scene was. They just could not believe that these three little boys who were just feet away in the home didn't even hear one scream or yell. They didn't hear people, you know, tussling around and fighting because clearly Sue fought with the defensive wounds that she had. And honestly, I can't really believe either that these children didn't hear anything. However, thankfully, Aunt Jackie that I spoke about earlier ended up taking in the surviving children and she ended up raising them. So naturally the investigation then moved on to questioning the neighbors to see if they had heard anything, especially since this was a small little neighborhood in the middle of the woods. So it would have been very quiet at night. You'd imagine a brutal attack like this would have caused some kind of noise, some kind of noise that the children apparently didn't hear, but you'd think neighbors would have heard, right? But it would turn out that multiple neighbors claimed that they didn't hear anything that night. Remember, Sheila was literally sleeping next door at the Seabolts home and she doesn't claim to have heard anything. The Seabolts never reported hearing anything and they were right next door. However, it would turn out that a couple living in cabin 16 claims that they were awoken around 1 to 2 a.m. to the sounds of muffled screams. So that begs the question, how did someone in a cabin farther away hear something and get woken up by it? But children in the same home, let alone the neighbors right next door, didn't hear anything. It's just odd and it's just part of the very confusing storyline of this case. Now, there were also multiple different stories about vehicles outside of the home that night. Some neighbors reported seeing an unfamiliar green van parked outside cabin 28 around 9 p.m. of the night of the murders. And that would have been about an hour before Sheila went over to the Seabolt's home and about an hour prior to Tina going back home. Meaning if whoever was in this vehicle committed these murders, that would have meant that Tina walked into the home about an hour into whatever's happening there. I say that, but also there's claims from other neighbors that dispute this saying that they actually seen a brown Datsun that night and it appeared to have a flat tire. So two very different vehicles. Again, just makes the story even more confusing. Now, Tina's disappearance was initially investigated by the FBI as a possible abduction, and the FBI would eventually actually back off saying that the local police were handling it properly. A grid pattern search would actually be conducted around a five mile radius of the cabin, and police canines were brought in. I've also seen there was helicopters involved, but after all of that searching, Tina was not found. So clearly there wasn't much here. There were three dead bodies, a missing little girl, three potential witnesses that claim they didn't see anything or hear anything, and just multiple different confusing stories from everyone involved. Some neighbors heard something that were farther away. The neighbors closer didn't hear anything. There were two different vehicles seen. It's just a mess. And there's also so many details that can't be really corroborated on what happened. Like what time did the two boys get home that night? How did they get home? All of that could be important. Now, despite this lack of evidence and just overall confusing narrative. There was an early suspect. There was actually two early suspects early on. And the suspect was actually the stepfather of Justin Smart, who had slept over at the cabin that night. One of the boys that had survived that night and been untouched in the bedroom. It would turn out that Martin Smart and his wife, Marilyn, both took the same typewriting class as Sue and the two families had eventually become friends. However, there is this theory that I've seen kind of is corroborated that Martin actually had a lot of anger issues issues and was actually physically abusive to his wife, Marilyn. And one of the theories go is that his wife, Marilyn had actually confided in Sue. And because Sue was a survivor of DV, she ended up trying to convince Marilyn to leave her husband. And when Martin found out about this, he was pissed. So the theory is, is that Martin killed Sue because she was trying to break up his marriage with his wife. But then we have John Bobetti, who goes by Bo. And he was actually an ex-con and friend of Martin that was actually living with him at the time of these murders. Bo was actually a veteran who suffered from PTSD and there are rumors that he had a crush on Sue. 
Now, this theory goes that Sue had actually rejected him on two different occasions. One article saying, and I quote, Bo, who allegedly had mob ties back in Chicago, told the police that he and Martin had been in a bar from around 9.30 to 10 p.m. that night. Later, however, he changed his story and claimed that they had been there around midnight. The investigation also turned up evidence suggesting that Martin and Sue had been having an affair, end quote. So there's a bunch of different rumors that Bo had a crush on Sue, that Sue was having an affair with Martin, that Sue was trying to break up Marilyn and Martin's marriage because Martin was abusive. There's all these theories that blame Sue for this happening. It's like on one side of theories, Sue was murdered because she was trying to break up their marriage. On the other side of theories, there was a love triangle between Martin and Sue and Marilyn, and then Martin went and killed her. But in my opinion, it's a little wild that this would all transpire because of these theories or these relationships that are or are not happening. And then he would also go and murder some of her children, but leave some of the children alive. It's just very confusing. But this honestly isn't just some off the wall conspiracy theory that Martin could be involved some way, somehow. Very early on in the case, Martin told investigators that a claw hammer had mysteriously gone missing from his home. Plumas County Sheriff Sylvester Thomas, who was working on the case at the time, also seemed to find Martin suspicious, saying that Martin had provided endless clues in the case that seemed to throw the suspicion away from him. Now, years later in 2016, a claw hammer matching the exact description that Martin had gave was found in a local pond not far from where the crimes happened and where everyone was living. Just down the road from where Cabin 28 once stood, they found a murder weapon, this hammer inside the pond. Surely this was a break in the case. It's my belief that uh, after the homicide that uh, they were trying to get rid of the evidence. As they passed by the pond, they tossed it in. The hammer was so rusted, no DNA could be pulled from it but it matched the exact hammer that was reported missing from one of the suspects, Martin Smart. Investigators believe Smart and his friend John Bobaday are the main suspects. They are no longer alive. They literally fled the area uh, within a day or so of, of, the, of the crimes. Wow. And, uh, and we spoke to the person that drove them out of town. Now, as you can see, this hammer has been logged as a murder weapon, but it, it was actually too rusty at this point to get any evidence off of it. It had been in this pond for decades, so it was really rough to try to get any information from it, but it is logged as a murder weapon. Investigators also say that very soon after the murders happened, both Martin and Bo ended up fleeing to Reno, Nevada. Things didn't seem to be going very well with Marilyn and he ran away. Now, during this time that Martin was in Reno, Nevada, he actually ended up writing a letter to Marilyn in which he said, and I quote, I've paid the price for your love and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Great, what else do you want? End quote. Excuse me? I've paid the price for your love and I bought it with four people's lives. Hmm, interesting. Seems to be three dead bodies and a missing little girl. That equals four to me. Now let's talk about Marilyn for a moment because in a documentary made in 2008, Marilyn Smart would come out and say that she believed her husband at the time, Martin, and his friend Bo were responsible for the murders. She claimed that on April 11th of 1981, she had left Martin and Bo at a local bar around 11 p.m. and returned home to go to sleep. And around 2 a.m. on April 12th, she stated she woke up to find the two of them burning an unknown item in the wood stove. Additionally, she alleged that Martin hated Johnny Sharp with a passion. However, in the documentary, Sheriff Doug Thomas also claimed that Martin had passed a polygraph exam. And we'll talk about Doug Thomas a little bit more later. Now, on top of all of that, there was actually a therapist that Martin would talk to in Reno, Nevada, that claimed that Martin had admitted to him that he'd murdered Sue and Tina, but said, and I quote, I didn't have anything to do with the boys, end quote. He also allegedly told the therapist that Tina was killed to prevent her from identifying him as she had witnessed the whole thing. And it would turn out that this therapist would actually go and tell the police what was said to him by Martin, but the police didn't do anything. Now, in another claim that Marilyn made, she also said that she found a bloody jacket in her basement and gave it to police, but there's no record of this jacket existing at all. And this jacket was thought to have been Tina's. Now let's talk about Justin for a moment here because Justin had initially claimed he had slept through the whole night. He didn't hear anything. He didn't see anything. However, he would eventually come out to say that he had started having nightmares about what had happened that night. And after this, he agreed to go under hypnosis. And when he was under hypnosis, he ended up remembering hearing strange noises that night, as well as five finding Sue in the living room with two men. Now a sketch artist would end up sitting down with him and they would end up sketching these two alleged suspects. One of the men had a mustache and short dark blonde hair and stood around six foot tall, while the other was clean shaven with long greasy black hair standing around five foot seven. 
Both men wore glasses. And according to Justin, both John and Dana ended up entering the home that night and began heatedly arguing with the men. A fight ended up ensuing after which Tina entered the room and was taken out of the cabin's back door by one of the men. Now, if we keep in mind and consider the timeline here, there was the vehicle spotted outside of cabin 28 around 9 p.m. If the boys somehow came home between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., walked in on these two men with Sue, whatever they were arguing about, they joined in on this argument. And then Tina left the Seabolt home, walked in the house at 9.55 p.m. I definitely think it could line up with her walking into whatever was happening, things escalated and Tina was whisked out to the door. Now, why these two men were at the home arguing to begin with, we don't know. We don't know anything. Again, it's just part of this whole giant mystery. And as days turned to months and months turned to years, people wondered if Tina would ever be found. And three years later, on April 22nd of 1984, a man collecting bottle caps 100 miles away in Feather Falls, Butte County, would come across a partial human skull and mandible bone. Authorities would be called to investigate, and at first they believed it was actually the bones of a Native American. However, on the third anniversary of the Ketty murders, an anonymous person would end up calling into the station and suggesting that the skull was of Tina Sharp. And after DNA analysis was done, the skull would be determined to be of 12 year old Tina Sharp. However, her cause of death could not be determined because they didn't find that much of her. When a search was conducted in the area, they ended up finding multiple different items, including a blue nylon jacket, Levi's jeans with a missing back pocket, a child's blanket, and an empty medical tape dispenser. Now, this caller that called in to the station to report that they thought this might be Tina was never identified. That phone call was never logged. However, a tape recording of this call would eventually be found at the bottom of an evidence box. And that's how I was able to play it for you here today because there seems to be a lot of shit happening in this case that we're gonna talk about in a moment of cover-ups, evidence not being logged properly and going missing, and this tape was one of those things. But the big question I have here is why was Tina taken from the cabin? Why was she the only one taken? Well, there are a lot of theories surrounding this case and there are a lot of theories surrounding why Tina was treated differently as well. Now, there is a big theory that Tina had possibly been R-worded and that she was pregnant, so the killers had kidnapped her to cover up their crime. And the reason that Tina was the only one that was removed from the home is because they wanted to hide her body so far away that no one would find it. And if anyone did find it, it would be in the state that it would eventually be found in where they couldn't determine what had happened to her and if she was pregnant at all. Now, as time passed, Martin Smart would eventually pass away in the year 2000 and Bo died actually in 1988. The Ketty Resort would go further downhill in disrepair and Cabin 28 would eventually be demolished in 2004 after too many people were trying to go there and visit the site. However, this case thankfully did not go completely cold. In 2013, the case would actually be reopened and Special Investigator Mike Gamberg and former Plumas County Sheriff Greg Hagwood would announce that this case was solvable. However, they blame the original local authorities that handled this case for the reason that it is not solved, saying that they made crucial mistakes, including evidence that wasn't logged, tampering with the crime scene, and leads that weren't properly investigated. There's only one road into Kitty and one road out. He was a martial arts instructor and taught the boys from time to time. The day before the homicide, Dana uh, was at my house. Kind of, made, uh, kind of made the case personal. And for former Sheriff Hagwood, it's also personal. When the murders occurred, I was 15, knowing the boys, you know, little Tina was in my mother's class. Yeah, it, it got real personal real fast. Sheila Sharp would also come out to say, and I quote, I was told the suspects were told to get out of town. So to me, that means there was a cover up. End quote. There was also a lot of suspicion with that anonymous 911 phone call. Again, as I said, it was never properly investigated. They never found out who it was and the evidence was never properly logged. It was just thrown in the bottom of a box. And I did mention earlier, the former sheriff that was originally on this case named Doug Thomas. And he's kind of the one being accused of covering up this case and being friends with Martin Smart. 
Now remember, this is a small town in the middle of the woods where everybody knew each other. We've seen a lot of corruption happen in cases that happen in small towns before. Again, everybody knows each other. So of course, if someone knows the sheriff and they do something wrong, they're gonna go to the sheriff and probably be like, hey, can you help me out, Betty? Unfortunately, it does happen way too often. So would I be surprised if it happened here? No, I would not. Again, not only was this a small town, this was a small town in the 80s when again, it was really easy to get rid of evidence and stuff like that, in my opinion, because there wasn't technology like we have today. There wasn't cameras everywhere that would catch someone doing this. Easily, something could just be misplaced. So honestly, I don't think this theory is too far-fetched. On top of that, Martin and Bo left town really soon after the murders were discovered. So could that lead you to assume that maybe they were tipped off to leave? Now, Doug was interviewed and he actually disputes all of these claims saying that they weren't friends, but then he'd also said that he'd counseled Martin and Marilyn when they'd come to him about their marital issues. So kind of, which is it? This is a small town. If Martin and Marilyn are going down the road to talk to you about their marital issues, how not of a friend could you be, you know? Now in recent years, the FBI would be brought back in on this case to examine that anonymous phone call and for a potential voice match to be made. And the hammers and knives would also be tested again for DNA. Cause again, our technology nowadays is way better than it was back in the eighties. It's 40 years ago. And we could be able to get DNA off of some of the stuff that they wouldn't have been able to back then. And it actually kind of seemed to work because in 2018, there was finally a break with DNA off of a piece of tape from the crime scene. And it would actually be linked to a living and identified suspect, which means that someone else was involved in this that wasn't Bo or Martin that had their DNA on that tape. And when I was doing research on this, I actually came upon a lot of people that actually think Sheila was involved with these murders. And I was surprised by that. And honestly, I can't imagine going through the trauma of coming home in the morning and finding half of your family dead, seeing all of that as a 14 year old child, and then later to have people blaming you for their murders. Now I'm not saying a 14 year old can't kill someone because I've covered enough stories on my channel about 14 year olds or children younger than 14 who kill. But honestly, I don't know what evidence there is to say that Sheila would have been involved in this. You'd think that the Seabolts would have noticed that she had left the house. Maybe she snuck out, I don't know, but she was at the Seabolts home that night. You think someone would have noticed maybe her leaving the house. In my opinion, I don't think there's anything to substantiate that Sheila was involved. So I kind of think it's ridiculous for people to be blaming someone whose half their family was murdered. And I think it's kind of in bad taste, but that's just my opinion. There's probably gonna be people down below that disagree with me and that is okay. But either way, this case has so many damn questions. If you wanna know my opinion after going through all of this and researching all of this, what little information we do have, in my opinion, I think the theory of this being a cover up could be potential. And here is why I think so. Again, this is just my theory. If Martin and or Bo really are the killers and the sheriff was allegedly friends with Martin, I do think the sheriff was initially investigating this crime, but I think once he started getting deeper into the investigation and realizing all things were pointing to his alleged friend, Martin, I think there's a possibility that he could have told him to get the hell out of Dodge and he started covering stuff up so the case would hopefully go cold. I think that's why things like that jacket that Marilyn claims to have been found just disappeared and everyone acts like it didn't exist. I also think that that anonymous phone caller, that tape was put into the box. So it looked like, oh yeah, it's in here, but it was never logged. Hoping that no one would try to reopen this case and dig deep enough in those boxes to find that information. There seems to have been a lot of things that were mishandled here. I think that's why certain things happen the way they did. I think it may be because of that possibly. But again, that's just my theory off the information we do have. Again, there is DNA that's been collected that matches a living unidentified person. So could there be someone else involved? Could Martin and Bo not have been involved at all? Maybe that's a possibility or maybe someone else was also involved and that's why their DNA was on that tape. But then that leaves us with the why. Why would Martin and Bo even wanna do this? Even for the mere reason that Sue might've been trying to break up the marriage. Would someone go as far to murder her and then her teenage son and her teenage son's friends and then the 12 year old daughter, just because of that. Honestly, I also think this theory of Tina being pregnant somehow, maybe she was R worded and the killers came to cover it up before things escalated maybe and people found out. And then, you know, Sue and the boys just kind of got in the way. I think there could have maybe been more happening here. But again, I, there's not really any evidence to suggest either way. It just makes me wonder why 
these certain people were murdered, why Tina was specifically taken out of the house, but no one else was, and why three other children that were all around Tina's age or younger were left alive in a bedroom. I think it's also important to note that Sue was found half naked, but she wasn't essayed. And this is commonly seen done as a humiliation technique in killings. So why was Sue the only one that was left in that state? Why would the killer want to humiliate Sue? Tina was dumped a hundred miles away. The boys were left alive. There has to be a reason why this all happened. Why there was so much evidence that wasn't logged and not looked into. Why were certain people treated differently? Why was certain evidence treated differently? Like why was that report that the therapist made that Martin had confessed to him ignored if there wasn't some kind of cover up happening here? It's all just odd to me. And there's just so much confusing information in this case. But what I do wanna know is what you all think. And if you have any other information that I didn't include in this case today that I don't know about, because I have so many questions that I want answered. I was literally, staying up the one night just thinking like why did certain things happen why were these people left like that why is this evidence like that I'm just so confused and i'm sure there are a lot of other people out there that have also stayed up really late at night wondering about this case and i just want us to all have a little conversation down below about it because i'm really confused and this case i really want to see solved i think there needs to be justice here for all involved and some of these older cases are ones that interest me the most honestly because there is usually so much information on them but a lot of it is just very confusing and there's this huge mystery to it and these are really the ones that keep me up at night i'm gonna be honest it's these unsolved missing persons and unsolved murder cases but again how do you all feel about this let's talk about it below and if you are also not subscribed i definitely recommend you hit that subscribe button. It allows me to continue creating content like this and spreading the word on stories like this. And with that, if you have any other cases you want me to cover, let me know down below and I will look into them. I hope you all stay safe out there. Lock your windows and doors and I will see you in the next video.